Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. Let's give the attendees a couple of minutes to join. Hello everyone, thank you for joining today's webinar organized by ISI Emerging Markets Group. The topic of the webinar is ISI Foresight Report, did we get it right? My name is Natalia Yanakeva and I'm the Head of Industry Research at INIS. I am pleased to welcome today's speakers. Uh, Andrzej Zhurevski is a research economist at our brand CAC Data. He's responsible for industry and macroeconomic analysis for Poland. His areas of expertise are labor market, economics of education, and institutional economics. Janvi Sangvi is a senior credit analyst at our brand Red Intelligence and is based in Singapore. At Red, she has developed the company's coverage on India. Her focus area also includes research on ESG-related topics, such as highlighting sustainability-related trends and bond issuer-specific sustainability analysis. And Mikhail Mikhailov is an industry researcher with our brand IMIS. He has over 15, experience, uh, 15 years of editorial experience in fields such as economics, technology, and monetary policy. At IMIS, he works as industry research for ASEAN. Before we get started, uh, to some of you who are not familiar with what we do at ISA Emerging Markets Group, we have been in the business of providing information on emerging markets for over 25 years. We have three brands, CSE Data, which provides macroeconomic data on more than 200 economies, IMIS, which focuses on providing company, industry, and country research on emerging economies, and Red Intelligence, the global leader in distressed and event-driven special situations intelligence on emerging markets. Before we move on to today's topic, I would like to mention a couple of points that will help us interact. During today's webinar, you will have the opportunity to ask questions. You can submit your questions in writing using the question panel on your right. And we will answer as many questions uh, as possible during the Q&A session at the end. Uh, we also have a handout section just above the question panel where we have uploaded our presentation. You can download it for your reference. So let's start with the... Uh, with today's topic. Uh, in today's webinar, our team of experts at ISA Emerging Markets is delving into the latest developments of key trends in the first half of 2023, following our foresight report that we published back in January. This report is our annual forward-looking publication in which we highlight the topics that we anticipate will drive the markets throughout the year. Uh, in today's webinar, we're looking back into some of the major topics in the foresight report and analyze their developments. Our CSE research economist, Andrzej Zhurovsky, will be analyzing how Europe avoided an energy crisis driven by the war in Ukraine and instead focus on sustainable green power. While our senior credit analyst, Javi Sangvi from Red, will be closely reviewing the ESG ratings and their perceived differences across providers. Additionally, EMIS industry researcher Mikhail Mikhailov will be examining the expected investment rebound in emerging markets. So Andre, please tell us how the initially anticipated energy crisis in Europe was avoided and the threat turned into an impetus to develop uh, for the development of green energy. Thank you, Natalia. 
Uh, good afternoon, everyone, or good morning if somebody has yet morning. It's afternoon in Poland already. Uh, during my presentation, I would like to discuss the topic of energy crisis in the European Union. Uh, we were the, the preparing this foresight report, Nat Natalia has mentioned, in late autumn last year. And in the European Union, at that time, the topic of energy crisis, uh, the, the, the fear of the cold winter, uh, was ironically the hottest topic uh, in discussions about economy uh, back then. Uh, therefore, we decided to cover this topic and just to, to think about how Europe can survive the, the winter and what, what can poss possibly happen. So the topic of the presentation is the question if the Europe has survived the, the energy crisis and if so, how was it possible? Uh, I would like to start with some context information. And the most important context information is something that everybody here knows very well about. Uh, in February 24th, uh, Russia has invited Ukraine. Uh, it was uh, th that was the beginning of the war, uh, but it was not. It was uh, it has uh, consequences not only for those two countries but also globally. The main factor of why this ha has uh, consequences is the fact that in response of the of the Russian aggression, European Union and United States and various other other countries. Uh, imposed the unprecedented sanctions on Russian Federation. Uh, those sanctions included banning Russia from SWIFT, uh, fin financial system, it was the ban for export and import of particular goods and various others, other measures. In response, Russia has also imposed some actions against Western countries. First of all, they threatened to limit the supplies of natural resources. They also ex impose some minor actions, such as expectation that European countries will pay for the natural gas or, uh, or pet petroleum in Russian rubles. Uh, there was also one, one thing that was uh, happened in the meantime. We still don't know what happened, but there was in autumn a mysterious explosion of a Nord Stream pipeline that threatened the supplies, supply of natural gas to Germany and other European countries. Uh, this actions has not, probably not that much impact on countries like United States, but it had tremendous effect on European Union. The fact, the, the reason for that is that Russia was the biggest supplier of all the major resources: natural gas, petroleum, and coal. Out of those goods, the most important is. Uh, natural gas because it cannot be easily substitutable. But as I mentioned, all of those commodities were very important. As we can see on the charts that, that has appeared in the screen right now, uh, before the war, Russia composed about a quarter of supplies of, of imports of petroleum to European Union. So this is a very significant fraction. If we look at the left hand, we can see natural gas and there the crude number for Russia is 23%, so slightly less than for petroleum. But if we, can, if we can look at those two purple triangles next to Russia, there is Belarus and Ukraine. And those countries were not produce, are not producers and never been producers of natural gas, but they were re-exporting gas from Russian Federation. Therefore, we can tell that the real number, the, the real dependence of European Union to, to Russian gas was about roughly 40%. 40% is the very significant factor. Uh, therefore, the, the, the fear that if, if we stop uh, supplying this, this uh, kind, of, kind of commodity from Russia will have tremendous effect for the European economy. If we can go to the next slide. Yes, as we can expect, as we expected, all of those uh, after the beginning of the war, the imports of all the commodities has fell. The most imp the most striking example is coal, the hard coal. Uh, in September 2022, European Union imposed a total ban for import of particular types of uh, of coke, of coal in particular coke, and as you can see, it fell just to 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 null. But it's not only the case of coal. The same story is for petroleum. Petroleum also fell almost from, from very significant number to almost almost null. And a very similar story is for natural gas. It's maybe not that striking, but it's still very clearly visible that it is much less than Europe imports much less natural gas as it was before the war. Uh, 
if we can it is therefore no wonder that the fears of that there will be not enough car hydrocarbons to hit European households were very vivid in autumn and summer last year. Uh, it was the major topic of discussion of the European Commission, hence the photo of Mrs. Ursula von der Leyen, who was really talking about saving gas for, safe, for a safe winter, but it is also the, the hottest topic in, in media. Uh, and media all over the Europe, from Sweden to Spain, every country was discussing and fearing what will happen if we stopped uh, having re re stop receiving uh, natural gas from uh, from Russia. Uh, okay, now, probably anybody listening to this presentation in the European Union uh, can confirm that the last winter was rather more expensive than it used to be uh, in former years the gas was the, our uh, we, we had to pay more for energy than we used to in in recent years but there were hardly any disasters. it wasn't it wasn't as catastrophic as we already feel so the question is how did we survive this winter and the first factor of this uh, were prices. Uh, even before the war, the prices of both petroleum and uh, natural gas were rel relatively high, especially natural gas was quite expensive in late 2021. Uh, but when the war has started, both of those prices skyrocketed. In the peak of uh, 2022 year, it was in, in the summer, the price of gas was $70 uh, per cubic meter. And this was roughly 10 times more than it used to be in early 2021. So 10 times increase in price is has absolutely would, may, would have an absolutely catastrophic effect on European economy if European households were expected to pay such such big price uh, for 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 energy. But what happens after the peak? The prices for both commodities started to fall. The prices of natural of, of crude oil are now above about the level that it was just before the war. It is still quite high, but it's not as high and not as catastrophic as it used to be. And there's one more thing I would like to pay your attention in, on, on this chart. Uh, in September, the G7 group imposed one more sanction on Russia, that is price cap for the ex import of uh, Russian uh, oil, which is called U U Ural. Uh, Ural price and this this cap is on $60 and as you can see Russia is on the global markets uh, roughly every every country in the world follows this uh, follows this sanction and Russian oil is much cheaper than uh, Brent or Texas oil but what happens with gas is even more striking as you can see on the chart this yellow line uh, represents the current price of natural gas and as you can see this is the price that is, it was l much lower than it was just before the war. And if we if we extended this chart to last 10 years, it would be roughly the average price that we had in recent time. So right now, the prices are not the very big problem uh, to pay for those commodities. Uh, but perhaps the, even the more important factor was a diversification of supplies. Uh, even before the war, there were some important actions uh, taken by some European countries. And I think that the most interesting and most important example is a Baltic pipe. Uh, that was an initiative of governments of Denmark and Poland to build a new pipeline uh, at the Baltic Sea to, to import natural gas from Norway. But it was the minor action, and some countries still was still were investing in Russia. Uh, most importantly, Ru uh, Germany was at the same time building a new Nord Stream 2 pipeline to 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 import uh, natural gas from Russia. But what happened in 2022 was absolutely change of the landscape. Uh, we can we can see. If you look closely at this map, all the green countries represent all, all the green color. Uh, represent the countries that has increased their share of exports of the natural gas to European Union. And what is even more important than the really real fact that uh, European Union was able to, to replace Russia with other countries. It's not the case that one country has replaced Russia and European Union became become as dependent as it was to Russia to another country. 
uh, no, this, in this case, this group is very diverse and diverse not only in the terms of number of countries, but also the geographic location. So first of all, we have Western rich countries, United States, United Kingdom and Norway. We have uh, Gulf states as Oman and uh, Qatar. And finally, we have a bunch of African countries, most notably Algeria, which is now one of the most important part trade partners of European Union. The case for petroleum is almost the same. We also had that the share of uh, Russia's imports, as I told you, was roughly one quarter. Uh, in 2023 until May, it was just 5%. And it was replaced by a, by a very, very diverse group of countries. As we can see here, almost half of the map is green. And most importantly, we have, again, Western countries uh, like United States or Norway, but also various other countries, and I would like to pay your attention to one maybe quite small but very interesting example of Angola, uh, which is the, the country in the South Africa, which never used to be a partner for European Union and now ex represents uh, more than 2% two, two of uh, imports of European, uh, uh, of natural, uh, of petroleum to European Union. And similarly, they also export uh, natural gas to European Union. So they became quite important partner. And if we focus only on gas, not forget about petroleum for, for a moment, uh, we can like definitely show another factor of a success story here. And this chart represents the, the, the value, how much natural gas was stored in European magazines. Uh, it shows that European Union was very well prepared to, uh, to, this, uh, to this crisis. And as you can see, this, uh, this chart, um, even before when when the war has started, the European Commission started to expect to European countries to fill the magazines. And even before the deadline, they were 100% full. Uh, as you can see, the, the, the supply of gas in, in natural, of storage uh, was quite safe for all the reason, for all the period. But even the another interesting factor is that, as you can see on those, this chart, there is always bottom in, uh, in winter. It didn't happen that much this year, uh, mostly because, the con first of all, there were more gas than expected, that there was more gas than needed. Second of all, the consumption has, was also slightly lower than it used to be in recent years. Uh, however, very important for this, for this fact is that right now in July, so well before the winter, magazines are again nearly about 100% full. Uh, yes, next slide. Uh, when I was talking about consumption, I, I can mention that there was also one more factor that influenced the good performance of the European Union, and that factor was pure luck. Uh, what I mean, uh, if we talk about uh, consumption of natural gas, one of the most important reasons to consume gas is to heat our households. And what happened this year? Uh, in early 2023, especially in January, the weather was extremely warm. In, in early January, before, I think New, New Year's Eve was the warmest New Year's Eve ever. I was even, I didn't even wear a jacket in the first of, of, of January. So that, that was the reason why the consumption fell significantly for a longer period. So that was a reason why Europe, one, that was one of the reasons why Europe consumed less gas than it used to consume in, in former seasons. And as you can see, even the peak was lower than, than it used to be in 2021 or 2020. Yes, and if we, if if we, if I'm about to conclude this uh, presentation, uh, there were various factors that help European Union to serve to survive the winter, but that raised another question: Can we be safe for the next winter, and what can we expect? Uh, while the diversification of, of gas was an important factor uh, to to survive the winter, it became clear that dependence on gas and other commodities uh, may cause some troubles. For example, right now, European Union imports more than 10% of gas from the United States. Geopolitically, this is very safe harbor, 
there is no risk that the United States will stop supplying European Union with natural gas, but they may ha happen another problem. And this problem already happened last year because the, mm, the main, so main uh, source how uh, United States are supplying uh, European Union with natural gas is by ships and uh, liquefied natural gas. And this is all done in Freeport LNG terminal that is located in Texas. It works fine, but last summer there was a malfunction and it didn't work for more than two, two months. So Europe cannot risk that that situation will happen again. Therefore, the main goal for the European Union right now is to decrease its dependence, not only for uh, gas from Russia, but gas at all. And that's uh, that's why the European Union is now significantly investing in other resources, mainly renewables. Uh, just after the start of the war, European Commission imposed a new program called Repower, U Repower EU, and this program inc uh, included a package of 300 billion euros for investments in energy, and not only to build new solar pa panels or so on, but also in, in investments that helps European Union consume less energy, for example, thermal modernization of households. If our households are, are warm, we don't need to, to uh, burn such, such so much carbon to make them, make them warm. Uh, but the most important investment is obviously uh, renewable energy. And as you can see on the slide, this gray, mm, great square, uh, gray rectangle represents what is the current share of renewables in total energy consumption in the Euro European Union. Just before the war, the target for 2023 was to reach in uh, about 10 years this green share, so more than 30 per 32% of total consumption. But when the war started, recently European Union started to negotiate this package again. And then in March this year, they agreed that we should uh, reach 42% by 2030, and there's still ongoing this discussion to reach 45. So as we can see, as um, immediate, one of the effects of the energy crisis is that Europe is significantly increasing, increasing its targets to, to invest in renewables. So the conclusion is that coincidentally, uh, goals of energy independence are in line with goals of climate action and Paris Agreement. So, paradoxically, the energy crisis may be good for our climate. Thank you. Thank you, Andrzej. Uh, when we prepared the first report, uh, this was indeed one of the main topics and we emerged from it more committed to green energy and with healthy amounts of gas in storage for next winter. Another hot topic in our foresight report was that of ESG, uh, and our colleagues from RED looked into the lack of unified ESG ratings and the criteria for objective assessments. Jami, please tell us what are the latest developments in that area. Thanks, Natalia. So, if you can't convince them, confuse them. And that seems to be the central theme of ESG ratings as what we see them. Um, Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone watching based on wherever you're located. Um, the topic for today is ESG ratings, whether they provide clarity or do they actually cause confusion? So before we dive into that, let's just take a step back into what are ESG investments? So first, the ESG investments are investments made in companies or funds that have a positive environmental, social and governance impact. So they're often also clubbed together as sustainable investing. And while this investing has been around for decades now, this gained a lot of prominence around 2020 as the pandemic underscored the need for sustainable investments. So companies, governments, consumers, investors, everyone became a lot more conscious of the need for sustainability and by extension, sustainable investing, right? So I'm an investor. I want to invest in sustainability. How do I do that? Right? How do I know which investment is truly sustainable? As an investor, I need to screen, I need to make comparisons between companies based on my objectives and the company's objectives, and I need to choose the correct and appropriate investment. And this is where ESG ratings come in. ESG ratings basically measure the ESG-related impact that and the risks that ESG-related risks that have potential impact on a company's credit quality. Now, these are often used for either pre-investment screening or post-investment analysis. And very similar to credit ratings, just as credit ratings measure the credit risks and how well credit risks are managed by companies, ESG ratings measure how well ESG risks are managed by companies. 
So, you know, for environmental examples are environmental pollution, carbon footprint generated, water usage, disposal systems, etc. Your, you know, when you look at the uh, social aspect of it, the social risks include workplace safety, human rights violations, wage equality, supplier practices, etc. And governance risks, you know, largely include focus on transparency, relevant and timely disclosures, organization ethics, and integrity, board diversity, structure, etc. Now, there are two ways in which ESG risks are usually incorporated and assessed by companies. Either they are assessed by existing credit rating agencies and incorporated into their overall credit assessment. Uh, for example, SNP incorporates material ESG factors into its credit assessment, and that can influence ratings in, in, ex in extreme cases. Or they are done independently by purely ESG rating providers like Sustain Analytics or MSCI ESG ratings, which only focus on the ESG rating on com of companies. So they are independent rating providers. Now, um, what is um, sorry? Can we please move to the next slide? Right. So you know why the aim of ESG ratings is to provide objective assessments. Unfortunately, the growth in the, the sheer growth in number of pro providers has led to the opposite effect. Instead of providing you an objective assessment, you are actually bombarded with the number of assessments and can actually make more confusing, uh, make, make investors more confused in their uh, assessments of companies. So according to a 2020 report, over 600 ESG ratings and rankings existed globally as of 2018, and that has continued to grow. So, you know, in one, on one side, you may think that maybe having so many providers will help get the most, you know, objective assessment of a company. But unfortunately, all the different assessors and their ratings come with their own methodologies, their own definitions, categories, rating scales, and even their own rating scores, um, the final rating scores. And that makes it very difficult to objectively weigh these risks. What are the large differences observed in? So there are three categories where the differences are largely observed in. One being the scope of issues that actually characterize the three components, E, S, and G. There is no defined taxonomy globally for ESG factors, and very often they're you know, interlinked, and that makes it even harder to separate them. The second being indicators for each issue. So, you know, Sustainalytics ratings has three building blocks. MSCI looks at 10 themes and 35 key issues. ISS has 100 categories and subcategories, and SNP has around 500 data points that they use to assess ESG ratings. Now, beyond just the variables that form and the indicators that go into doing these ratings, the weightings are the third most important thing, wherein you know the amount of weightage that you provide to each factor differs among all the providers out there. For example, say 20% of the overall managed or unmanaged risk score for sustain analytics is allotted to unmanaged corporate governance, while MSCI's weighting score methodology allocates 5 to 30% weightage to each of the 35 key issues. As an investor, I don't know how to calculate this. It's, it's a complicated math equation that is not going to help me at all in my decision. Then there are also other you know, differences you can see in terms of like the presentation or the, of the ratings or the scores, depending on what metrics that they use. For example, the rating scale used by Sustainalytics has five categories. MSCI has three categories. Refinitives has four levels. ISF and MSCI have graded scales. Sustainalytics uses deciles and quartiles. SNP has a numeric scale ranging from one to 100. And Sustainable Fetch uses one to five rankings, right? Some of them also analyze the companies or provide you rankings on an absolute basis versus others do it on a relative basis, uh, which is to say that this company is relatively worse than its peers rather than look, looking at it on an absolute basis. So that's another point of confusion. Um, right. So let's just take one small example. Um, Adani Ports. Adani Ports is an Indian port operator. It's the largest Indian port operator. And we looked at, you know, the ESG rating for this one company across the different providers. So if you look at the first side, the left side, you look at Sustainalytics, it provides us a score of 12.6, which indicates very low risk. Um, and then go to the far right, you see Refinitiv, which also gives it a score of 70 out of 100, which is a high, high score, but indicates low risk as well. 
So if I look at these two, Adani Ports is a great investment for me on an ESG front and being sustainable. But then you come to MSCI ESG ratings, it gives it a rating of triple C, which is the lowest rating possible that indicates the highest risk possible on MSCI scale. Right now, Sustainalytics has looked at it on an absolute basis. MSCI and Refinitiv look at it on a relative basis. So while Refinitiv is saying that Adani Ports is relatively better than its peers, MSCI is saying it's relatively worse. And this also comes down to what they define as relative. Who are these industry peers? They categorize it separately. So clearly, it is a classic case of too many cooks in the kitchen. So in this case, instead of just spoiling the food, it can ultimately result in greenwashing or impact washing. Um, greenwashing is basically when companies make impact focused claims without truly demonstrating positive sustainable impact. And in turn, this could also repel, you know, retail investors who would be skeptical about the claims made because they don't have a single objective source to make evaluations, right? But at the same time, this can also give on the flip side, mixed signals to companies about their performance and the actions that the market will value or expect from them, right? Because in turn, this will again impact ESG investments into these companies. So again, you know, we already went through the characteristics and the evaluation methods. And as if that wasn't confusing enough, you have to also, as an investor, navigate through implicit issues like weak disclosure requirements, credibility checks of information provided by a company, or like weak regulations, because there is no strong regulation anywhere in the world right now governing ESG investments or ESG rating providers, rather. So now, but, but why is this so important? Now, according to Morningstar, total assets in sustainable investments increased 25-fold since 1995, and over 2.7 trillion assets are now managed by 2,900 ESG funds. Now, a PFC, PwC report in October 2022 just found that ESG investing could soar 84% further to 33.9 billion by 2026, from just 18.4 in 2021. So that at that point, by 2026, at least a fifth of the total AUM in the world would be invested in ESG. Right. So now if you are going to more than double in certain regions like the United States, it says that it's going to more than double to $10.5 trillion. Obviously, investors and the public will need more transparency. You will need more disclosures and you need more socially responsible leadership from companies. And while everyone is quite aware of this, generating the regulations has taken some time now. But the good thing is that, you know, the US SEC recently finalized its climate disclosure rules. And that's why also the European Union has now issued some benchmarks and some disclosures. So while there are steps being taken, unfortunately, the differences in regulations still do remain, right? They, they overall ESG ratings and their activities of the rating providers still are largely unregulated. But the good thing is that there is some steps being taken. So as an investor, it is still a little bit assuring that you know the, the people that are people like investors like us, retail investors or this institutional investors, they've been calling for these regulations and there are steps being taken in that uh, direction. So there are certain jurisdictions such as UK, India, Japan, where there are actually regulation of ESG rating providers being considered currently and they're in in development. Um, just last month, the European Commission also issued a proposal for the regulation of solely for ESG rating providers. So, you know, they, they, they do suggest that ESG rating providers now should be authorized and supervised by ESMA under proposed regulations. They suggested a list of um, steps to basically increase the transparency and credibility. But while we still await actual regulations in the space, I just hope that the readers of the report and the foresight also get a little more insight into the world of ESG ratings and how strongly they impact the global market, as well as highlight the fact that, you know, despite the growth in these providers as investors, we still need to be very wary and conduct our own analysis of such ESG factors. And, you know, when you want to make investment decisions, you still cannot, you know, totally rely on one ESG rating provider just because you have gotten it from them because what they look at may be very different from what you look at, and what they look at will definitely be very different from what all other peers that they have, all other rating providers out there will look at. So yeah, thank you. 
Thank you for giving more clarity to this multitude of ESG ranking methodologies, Janvi. Uh, Mikhail, over to you. Uh, please tell us whether we already witnessed the expected investment rebound in the emerging markets. Yeah, I wish it was that simple. Uh, thank you, Natalia, and uh, thank you all for joining us. As those of you who follow us already know, in December of every year, we try to look at the, over the horizon and uh, share with you what we think we've seen in our annual foresight report. So to do that, we use the EMIS and the CIC platforms, and of course, our own observations and experience. Um, by the way, the foresight report is available from the EMIS and CIC platforms, and anyone can download it for free. So, um, ever since the COVID-19 pandemic broke out, uh, the words of one of my economics professors have been echoing in my head. He used to say as an axiomatic truth that um, whenever there was trouble in Western economies, the emerging markets suffered the most because investors pulled out uh, their money and uh, waited until the skies cleared. Uh, and I think we can all agree that in 2022, there was uh, no shortage of trouble uh, for the economy. So. I thought it was a perfect time to test the axiom and see whether or to what extent capital was flowing out of the emerging markets. So to contain inflation, uh, the Fed hiked interest rates, making borrowing difficult and expensive. Uh, the policy tightening uh, and the strong fundamentals of the US economy at the time and the geopolitical situation drove the US dollar up, which threatened emerging economies with uh, large uh, US dollar denominated debt. So naturally, investors were spooked and pulled out uh, a record of $70 billion from emerging market uh, funds between uh, January and September of 2022 alone. Um, the MSCI Emerging Market Index lost 31% on the year as of October 2022. So in short, the convergence of a strong dollar, economic uncertainty in the wake of COVID-19 and geopolitical instability uh, culminating uh, with the Russian invasion of Ukraine in 2022 looked like the making of a perfect storm for emerging market economies. So. For my analysis in foresight, I looked at portfolio investments in stocks and sovereign debt, uh, as well as uh, at uh, foreign direct investments in emerging economies. Um, for stock investment monitoring, I used the Morgan Stanley Capital International Emerging, emerging Markets Index, or the MSCI EM Index, as it's known. Uh, it comprises about 1,400 uh, large and mid-cap companies from uh, 24 emerging economies, all considered to be bellwether in their respective sectors. Um, to gauge the market for sovereign debt, I use uh, global data by EPFR, which stands for Emerging Portfolio uh, Fund Research, and also data by the Institute of International Finance, or the IIF, uh, for investments, overall investments in uh, emerging markets. Finally, for foreign direct investment data on emerging economies, I use our own databases, uh, which is available on the CDM Next platform. So <clears throat> I, I want to make a point here that uh, the data for FDI differs from data for portfolio inv in investment in that it's much less reactive to sudden changes in the environment. In other words, uh, while unexpected events such as interest or tax hikes or even political instability affect the stock market and the debt market almost immediately, they take much longer to uh, register in FDI flows. So, to put a short, a long story, story short, uh, in my report, I argued that uh, despite the doom and gloom that uh, characterized 2022, by the end of the year, there was actually light visible uh, at the end of the tunnel. Uh, inflation was plateauing as uh, 
food and energy prices driven up by the war in Ukraine stopped climbing and the US dollar lost steam. So although between uh, January and September of 2022, investors withdrew, as I said, a record $70 billion from funds invested in EMs, in December 2022, non-resident flows to emerging markets jumped to $16.8 billion as opposed to the $13.7 billion in November. Similarly, uh, having hit rock bottom in October 2022 at uh, 842 points, which marked uh, more than 30% loss on the year, uh, the MSCI Emerging Markets Index climbed to 956.4 points. Uh, uh, on the last day of 2022, which was uh, about a 100-point turnaround in just a couple of months. FDI uh, figures, though, remained flat and did not uh, follow the same roller coaster trajectory, uh, just because they are inert in, in their nature. So, <clears throat> Based on some reassuring indicators, such as uh, China's transition away from hard zero COVID policy, uh, the fact that uh, Europe, as uh, Andrea already told you, uh, was likely to not uh, suffer the energy crisis many had predicted, and the fact that, uh, frankly, um, emerging economy assets were oversold in 2022, I made the bold statement that in 2023, emerging economies could offer a better return to investors than uh, their uh, developed counterparts. Uh, my belief was also reinforced by the fact that uh, compared to previous um, crises, uh, emerging economies now play a significantly more prominent role in the global economy. Uh, I think they account for more than 50% of the global GDP at uh, purchasing power parity and uh, about 50% of global capital flow. So additionally, uh, now they they have much stronger domestic consumer base and uh, more investment resources they could lean on just to compensate for uh, foreign capital outflows. So it has been more than six months now since the Foresight 2023 report was published and uh, we thought it was uh, probably a good time to see whether uh, theories about the emerging market capital flows and the economy in general panned out. Uh, in, in that time, in these six months, a lot has happened um, and I think we can say that uh, the streak of bad luck for um, emerging economies continues. After giving up on its zero COVID policy in January, uh, China has been hit by rolling waves of COVID, which contributed to a weaker than expected economic recovery. Also in January, Brazil was rocked by public uh, unrest accompanying the transition of power between President Bolsonaro and uh, President Lula da Silva. And then, uh, on uh, the 6th of February, a powerful earthquake killed more than 50,000 people, left hundreds of thousands homeless, and inflicted an estimated uh, $35 billion worth of damages to an already struggling Turkish economy. So these events further underscore the fact that the umbrella term emerging economies is very loose and uh, it's used to refer to a vastly diverse group of nations with uh, completely different economic fortunes. For example, there are countries like Vietnam, which enjoys great political and economic stability and also benefits from uh, diversification away from China by uh, large multinational companies. And there are countries like Zambia and Sri Lanka and Lebanon, and just to name a few, uh, which have already defaulted on their foreign debt. And also, there is Turkey, which somehow manages to grow its economy despite steep inflation. So, given all that, I think it's uh, that treating all these countries as a homogenous group of, uh, for the purposes of predictive analysis is very challenging. 
but uh, let's get back to the indicators and uh, see how we did. Uh, so since uh, the 30th of December 2022, the MSCI uh, Emerging Market Index has been on a veritable roller coaster ride, uh, reaching a size of 1,052 points uh, in the end of January and as low as uh, 940 points on uh, by mid-March. So as of last week, it was um, 984.7 points, which is almost 3% higher than on the last day of 2022. So marginal progress. Um, more importantly, uh, on the 9th of June, the International Institute, the Institute of International Finance announced that uh, in May 2023, Foreign investors had uh, generated a net inflow of 10.4 billion US dollars in emerging market portfolio investments, despite uh, three straight months of outflows from China. May was also the fifth consecutive month of positive foreign investor cash flow to emerging markets. Still, uh, despite the positive balance, uh, investment in emerging market debt and equities is not lift to the high expectations created in February uh, when investment hit uh, a two-year high driven by hopes of uh, the reopening of China and uh, global deceleration of interest rate hikes. So in terms of uh, foreign direct investments, uh, there is a, an interesting new wrinkle that, that has appeared. As geopolitical tensions rise, uh, decision makers and policy makers uh, look to establish uh, their supply chains closer to home and in countries they consider friendly and uh, they can trust, which is called French shoring. So French shoring measures to some extent have been proposed by both the US Treasury and the European Commission. China in turn has the ambition of replacing imported technology with uh, local alternatives in order to uh, depend less on its geopolitical rivals. So in this environment, I believe that it could actually turn out to be easier to predict FDI flows just based on geopolitical alignment. Uh, but like I said, uh, FDI trends take longer to develop. So uh, coming up with a definitive picture at this time is difficult, to say the least. So, if you are one of these people that like to keep a score, I can say that uh, we were right to expect an improvement in uh, investment, investment flows to emerging markets. But the more optimistic scenario that had started to emerge by February has not materialized yet. So as with most things concerning the future, we'll just have to wait and see. What is certain, however, is that uh, we are all very grateful to those of you uh, who read the Foresight report and came here today. Thank you for the privilege uh, being able to talk to you. Thank you, Mikhail. Uh, now let's move uh, to the Q&A session. Um, I can see that some of you have already submitted your questions. Just a reminder, you can do that uh, and the panel on your right. Um, Andrzej, shall we start with you? Uh, there is a question for you. Can we tell if Russia is still exporting oil or gas to Europe, but does it through partner countries? We could see on the map, for example, that India was green. Okay, thank you. That's difficult and quite tricky question. And the most honest answer would be, I don't know. Uh, but I can tell what we know about that, that topic. First of all, we know quite well that uh, Russia is doing something to hide its real export. And we have some proofs for that, uh, that, for example, the movement in the port of Vladivostok in Russian Far East is quite increased. Uh, there are some media or some, some reports about uh, Russia building some so-called shadow shadow fleet of, of tankers uh, just to to export oil to the, to different co countries uh, but what we 
uh, what we know this the scale of this of this fact is not very significant it only represents a tiny tiny fraction of of this loss that that i was showing you you in the charts and it's most likely the, uh, it's, it's it's only about uh, petroleum exports, not about natural gas, and the reason for that is that you can you can export uh, natural gas in two ways. First, first are pipelines, and pipelines we know what's going on with, with pipelines; they are easily to uh, to monitor. And the second way is liquefying natural gas and as, as in the form of LNG. And we know that Russia is not doing re-exporting LNG to other countries uh, simply because they don't, do not have enough infrastructure to do so. Russia used to export its oil, its natural gas via pipelines, and they didn't, uh, did ha never have exported it via LNG. Thank you, Andrzej. Uh, Janvi, we have a question for you as well. Uh, what are some examples of greenwashing? What are some ways that you can forecast or catch companies that are greenwashing? Uh, thanks for the question. Well, greenwashing, unfortunately, is all around us. Um, basically, you know, when you're trying to do any sort of marketing ploy or you're doing any sort of misguided PR stunts or you're changing the packaging of a product, while continuing to use unsustainable ingredients or practices. That's effectively what greenwashing is. Um, specific examples I can think of one is H&M, uh, you know, the clothing brand. Uh, there was a report I remember in 2021 from the Changing Markets Foundation, um, and they were basically finding out whether the claims of you know, high street fashion brands, whether they were misleading or not. So they found that 60% of total claims were actually misleading. And H&M was actually faring the worst because 96% of their claims didn't hold up. They just tricked people into, you know, who are concerned with environmental impact into buying their products. So this could be something like saying made with sustainable sources. And then there's a small asterisk and terms and conditions where you realize that the way they define sustainability is not really what you would call sustainable at all. Um, another example could be something like gaslighting your consumers. So Shell, for example, the oil and gas company, um, it's responsible for one to two percent of global CO2 emissions every year, and they continue to invest billions in oil and gas. But they apparently had a Twitter poll going around asking users what they were willing to do to help change and re or reduce emissions. So you know when you're sort of gaslighting the consumers, then that's a very big sign that you yourself are not, you know, confident enough to take steps in towards sustainability. Um, in the case of Shell, though, yes, there was, you know, like a sort of justice served because the European court did order them to reduce carbon emissions by 45% by 2030 compared to their 2019 levels. So this was actually the first time that, you know, there was a private company that was ordered by a court to reduce emissions with like within a certain amount of time and by a certain amount. Um, but unfortunately, it's not the end of you know, their practices, obviously. And then in 2022, they also again launched a marketing campaign to promote their clean energy business in UK. And this unfortunately had some misleading claims about their involvement in providing clean energy and e-vehicle, you know, the e-charging stations. Um, there was a complaint filed by you know campaign group they argued that Shell should not be making such claims, obviously, and uh, they should give, if they want to make such claims, they should give the total environmental impact of the company rather than just focusing on a very tiny part of steps that they are taking, which probably they were mandated by the court to take, right? But obviously, they do engage in clean energy, but their business has still resulted in like 1.2 billion tons of CO2 emissions just last year. So there are certain things that you must look out for, you know, like when you want to check whether a company is greenwashing or not, like are they using vague terms? Like, you know, if you, they, they, they're using terms which sound green rather than our actual impactful, um, you know, steps taken to impact sustainability. Um, so like a company, anytime you're seeing a company use any sort of word which doesn't have a concrete legal meaning, like saying you're farm fresh or you're conscious. Um, sometimes you also see them, you know, make irrelevant claims. Now, for example, in terms of the 
vague sounding. One example could be Adani Group. Um, it has, I remember seeing a presentation from them, like an investor presentation telling them, we last year touched the lives of 2.1 billion people. What does that mean? <laughs> you touch like, people's lives just by providing them the services, by providing them products. What are you trying to, you know, what, what is the meaning of touching a life? It doesn't have an actual meaning. It just means that they're trying to, and this is their sustainability report, right? So in a sustainability report, when you claim this, then clearly you're trying to mislead your consumers by saying that they have done, as a reader, I may think that they have done so many activities that it has improved the lives of someone, but we don't know what and how, because they don't give us that information. And another thing could be like making a very big noise, but very tiny sort of, green attribute with on like an otherwise very anti-green product uh here green equals to sustainability i'm just using them interchangeably um but yeah like if you're misleading consumers or you're like putting num misleading numbers or you're repackaging something just to make it look green so you know there's a lot of psychology that also goes into marketing and um sales of these some a lot of products right like especially for groceries and um for example if you have a milk provider and you buy a particular milk they just change the packaging into a green rather than a blue looking or they add like three leaves on their packaging to make it look green um but the product hasn't changed right uh they've just made some sort of marketing claims about sourcing materials or like this much was clean sourced without actually giving you any proper details about it so these are some examples that you can you know sort of watch out for to see whether a company is actually greenwashing or not and i think the most important thing is to keep in mind that um when you're getting any information from a company is it the information in totality or is it also misrepresented in any way so these are some of the things you can keep in mind Thank you, Janvi. And uh, Mikhail, there's a question for you as well. Uh, in your presentation, you mentioned Vietnam as a positive example among emerging economies. Can you tell us why? Uh, sure. Yeah. Uh, so I've been covering Vietnam for a few years now, and I believe that it has a very strong upside. Um, it's a young country with growing population, um, very good political stability, good economic stability. In the past, um, some investors were wary of uh, the country's somewhat uh, subpar infrastructure and the fact that uh, foreign, foreigners couldn't own uh, land outright in Vietnam. But from uh, what I see, I believe that the government has found a clever way to solve both issues, actually. So they um, they build business parks uh, and uh, locate them in areas where they have good um, power, uh, gas and road infrastructure, um, and uh, and they just have them ready and hire them out on turnkey basis to uh, manufacturers. So in this in this in this way they they make it uh, very easy for foreigners to just launch their operations there. Uh, but that's not all, uh, as in any other success story, there is an element of luck and I think Vietnam is lucky uh, because it benefits from French shoring. Uh, in particular, the desire of investors to diversify uh, their manufacturing away or outside of China. So they're a huge ben uh, ben beneficiary of, of this trend. So that's why I'm so bullish on Vietnam. Thank you, Mikhail. So as we are approaching the one hour mark, uh, we can wrap up the, uh, this webinar. I invite you to review the flagship publications of ISI. In the industry research team, we produce the Emis Insights industry reports, which are country reports on specific industries for all the main emerging markets and regions, and we cover more than 20 industries. We also publish the CAC Insights Macroeconomic Reports, uh, which each quarter offer a comprehensive overview and outlook of the world's largest economies uh, using our proprietary CAC leading indicator. And with the industry reports of threat intelligence, you will gain the competitive edge you need with in-depth analysis of key market players and projections of their future performance. 
Uh, and uh, we also have our regular um, annual forward-looking report for SIT, as mentioned in this webinar several times. Uh, this, is, this webinar is a follow-up to the 2023 edition of the report. And finally, I will encourage you to visit our dedicated webinar pages uh, in IMSI and CSC, where you can find recordings of all our webinars and register for our upcoming events. Uh, when the webinar closes, uh, a survey will pop up on your screen where you can share your experience about today's webinar. Uh, thank you to all of you who attended the webinar and to our speakers, and I hope you have a good rest of your day, and see you soon. Thank, thank you. you. Bye.